Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining uh, the first session of Transform Smart Cities and Communities, and welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Cummins, uh, and I'll be your MC today for today's session with uh, Rami Saad, Karan Mahan, and Audrey McKeown. Uh, as you know, the Transform Series is a new free online seminar that explores the growing impact of digital transformation on business and society. Uh, we'll be covering a total of six areas ranging from the future work to smart cities and communities, which we're going to talk about today, uh, the circular economy and others and, and, and people who have attended previous events uh, so far. Uh, today, we're going to look at the fifth of these by focusing on the impact of increased connectivity on quality of life and economic development in urban and rural communities. Uh, we're delighted to be joined, joined by Rami Saad, project manager uh, at uh, Buigi Batman International, Karan Mann, who's a projects facilitator at Smart DCU, and Audrey McKeown, uh, who is CEO of Aquis BI. Um, now, feel free to send in your questions during the session using the Q&A function, and you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to go through the three talks today, and then we'll hold on to the questions until the very end. Uh, so please do stick with us, and then we will work our way through the various questions that come in. Uh, but as I said, just make sure that you use the Q&A function uh, for that. So please be aware that the, the, the chat function itself is disabled. So again, it's only the Q&A tab where you can communicate with myself, and, and I will relay again your questions uh, to the panel. Uh, we will then, okay, compile questions. Okay, and I'll ask the questions of, of uh, Rami, Kieran, and Audrey, uh, and we'll get to as many as we can within the allocated time. Okay, so again, looking forward to your questions, your engagement, um, and again, just remember to use that QA functionality at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so without further delay, um, I just again like to thank our three speakers who've taken time out to be with us today. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and so I'll hand over to the panel. Um, to start the session. Um, and I think Remy is going to start. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'll uh, just start by sharing my screen. Please let me know if it's okay and they're seeing the screen. Yeah, that's perfect, Remy. Thank you. Okay. So uh, uh, I will start by presenting myself. So uh, I'm Rami Saad, and I'm working uh, in a construction French company called uh, Buick Construction, and uh, more precisely in the international department. And now uh, I'll be presenting to you uh, the smart city concept as a, and an example called En Dijon. So it's a smart city in France uh, in, uh, in a city called Dijon. So before starting, uh, I may introduce the concept of smart cities. So uh, the, the main concept is to introduce uh, sensors, meters, and cameras in the city in order to collect the data and visualize and analyze this data in a real-time manner in order to monitor and enhance the public utilities and networks in order to simplify the inhabitants' lives and finally, to create an interaction between the city officials and the existing community. So uh, for that, uh, Buick Energy Service, which is a subsidiary of Buick Construction with, part, with partnership with several French companies, uh, create the concept of En Dijon in order to, to, uh, uh, in order to, uh, to digitize the, the existing city in France. Uh, so, uh, let me start my presentation with the quote of François Rebzaman, the mayor of Dijon City, uh, saying to us that we are in the process of building a modern and inclusive metropolis at the service of its citizens. So for that, on Dijon project, we wanted to both modernize our administrations and improve the quality of our services to citizens, and particularly those related to public space, uh, such as uh, cleanliness and mobility, and finally regarding security and public lighting. So for that, the on Dijon relies uh, to manage remotely from a connected cockpit, all the urban equipment, 
like traffic lights, street lighting, video projection. And all of that will apply this concept on 23 municipalities in the area. So let me share with you the, the main connected map of Smart Dijon, uh, where I will start to explain to you uh, the concept of the cockpit. So uh, the cockpit will, will manage remotely the urban equipment and interventions. It's a building with 1200 square meters area and gather around 50, uh, 50 persons in order to handle calls from residents around 630 calls per day in order to monitor the safety of public areas and spaces to ensure the remote surveillance of buildings and connected urban equipment and finally uh, to monitor the mobility in the territory. Then I'll go now to the uh, connected and manage urban equipment in order to manage remotely from the cockpit by the removal of bulky items, by road cleaning, by road traffic control, and finally surveillance of public areas. And of course, thanks to open data, uh, the community wishes to stimulate and uh, to strengthen the digital ecosystem local by also to, uh, wishing to become uh, the future creation of a living lab and to, to create the metropolis of tomorrow. And finally, the, 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 the all inhabitants uh, of the metropolis will benefit from, uh, from, the, from, from this project uh, by facilitating the mobility on the territory, by choosing the quickest way to get around, uh, uh, by a more adapted quality uh, of service on the road, uh, by uh, dematerializing uh, the administrative procedures uh, and finally by involving the inhabitants uh, in the life of the metropolis. So let me introduce you firstly the, the key dates of the project development. So during uh, the middle of 2015, uh, the first study was conducted by, by partners in order to check the feasibility and the smart readiness of Dijon. And in, in, uh, in, uh, in the months of February 2018, we start the works by building the cockpit and integrating the sensors and cameras in the city. Then the works ended in December 2018. And in, in April 2019, we launched the Un Dijon platform. So as I said that the project was reali realized by Bouygues Energy Service, which is subsidiary of big construction uh, with, a, with a partnership with Citelum. It's a, it's a subsidiary of EDF. It's an energy group in France. And of course, with Suez for the infrastructures and Capgemini as a consultant for the project. And all these partnerships were supported by the European Union and the Région Bourgogne Franche Comté. The main key figures of this project is that one of five million euros contract were financed by the region and the European fund. Uh, 34,000 point of lights were renovated by connected 100% uh, LED light. Two of five uh, geolocated vehicles and 130 equipped with radio. Uh, of course, there were connected buildings around 180 building uh, were connected to the cockpit in order to check the security and the performance of these buildings, including 13 renovated buildings. Of course, there, there, there was 65% uh, of energy saving and finally 269 uh, uh, video protection cameras were, were renewed in order to be connected and directly monitored from the cockpit. So I finished the presentation of En Dijon with uh, with a with a video of three minutes, uh, and then I'll uh, I'll continue my presentation to introduce you the response concept and the Reno concept. Okay.
thank you for your listening. Uh, I will continue the presentation. So after making the Dijon Metropolis as a smart city, now we are starting a project with them in order to renovate a district into a positive energy district uh, in the framework of response project. So it's a European H2020 project funded by the European Commission in order to develop and test new solutions to achieve a positive energy district. So the, the consortium is formed of 53 European countries and partners, sorry, European partners from uh, around uh, 13 uh, different uh, countries, European countries, and divided into three teams. The French case, the Finns case, and finally, uh, the teams of the fellow cities. 54% of them are industries and PMEs. So I've said the concept will be tested on two cities, in Dijon, in France, and Turku, in Finland. After that, there will be six cities who will follow uh, uh, the, the Dijon and Turku and will test and implement the response concept. So the duration of this project is around five years starting November 2020 with a budget of 23.5 million euros. Uh, let, me, uh, let me present to you fastly the main objectives of this project in order to achieve the net zero energy buildings, to reduce the carbon emission and the carbon content during the renovation, to increase the energy storage on site, to interconnect the cities after making them smart cities and connected. And finally, to, to, to create the concept of resilience, of resilient and safe cities. For now, uh, we are participating in a second uh, uh, Reno project with DCU, uh, with DCU, where we are uh, we are digitizing and creating an automated renovation uh, plan from the uh, design and planning phase to the construction phase, and finally to the operation and maintenance phase. So, in a in renovation project for construction, there are three phases. The first one where we, we, we define the concept and the, the design of the renovation, we choose the technologies. The second phase is the delivery and installation phase of the technology on site. And the third phase is the maintenance and the operational phase. So it's a project, it's a H2020 project too. It's financed by the European Commission with 18 European partners from 10 different European countries. So the duration of this project is four years, starting June 2020, and a budget of 4 million euros. Don't be scared, it's very, it's very simple. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll explain to you fastly uh, what is this, uh, the concept of Reno. So as I told you that we set in the beginning of the project, KPIs in order to reduce the, uh, the time and the cost of the planning and design phase, to reduce the retrofitting phase duration and cost, and finally to uh, achieve uh, the performance uh, indicated in the beginning of the project of the building as energy consumption and carbon emission. So all these, uh, uh, all these KPIs will be monitored in a, in a real-time manner once the project is delivered. So for that, this concept will be tested on four demo cases. The first one is in Denmark, the second one is Poland, the third one is in Greece, and the fourth one is in, in France. For that, in order to start the concept, we create like a database where we, we stored all the building elements for the envelope, facades and roofs, all the energy system to create heating, domestic hot water, in order to create storage solution and renewable energies. And from this database, we'll, we'll try to, 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 to generate like thousands and uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, scenarios in order to optimize, uh, uh, sorry, this scenario will be generated by digital, digital twin in order to, to, to assess uh, 
the best one and create the renovation plan. Once these technologies are selected, there will be another tool where we'll, uh, we'll uh, purchase, we'll manufacture, we'll deliver, and we'll install all the technologies on site. So we'll be able to track all these phases using the e-logistics in order to simplify and to fasten the procedure. On the other hand, we'll create like a e-cockpit in order to monitor the progress on site, in order to accelerate the works and to reduce the safety uh, and health accidents. And on the other hand, the third tool will be like an augmented reality tool in order to, uh, to train all the workers how to install and how to maintain these tools. And the final tool is during the operational phase is like a, coll a collaborative platform in order to, to, to create like a communication platform between all the stakeholders from architects, construction, uh, construction companies, uh, residents, uh, uh, demo, uh, like a so so social, uh, social housing owner. And in order to, to communicate between, uh, bet bet between these stakeholders to check the uh, comfort of the occupants, to check that the energy bills are reduced due to the renovation project, to check the good performance of the building. So mainly these are the, uh, the, the two main renovation project that we are uh, that we are uh, testing that after the uh, after uh, ma making Dijon as a smart city. So mainly these are my slides. So thank you a lot and uh, waiting for your questions. Great stuff. Uh, thank you, Rami. And our next speaker is, is, is Corona. Hi, you folks. Thank, thank you, Mark. So we're going to today talk about Smart ECU and let you know all about it. It's a journey. We're talking about different projects we've done, where we are now and where we're going in the future. There's lots of things involved in Smart ECU including a recent hydrogen smart bus. So let's just begin with introduction to Smart ECU. <clears throat> so Smart ECU is part of the Smart Dublin ecosystem. So Smart Dublin was set up by the four local authorities to use new technologies to improve the services, enhance the quality of life in Dublin. In other words, make it a better place to live, work or visit. And technologies is the key word here. Now to use the quadruple helix framework, this means leveraging the strengths of local government, academia, industry and communities. Looking at the challenges that cities are facing, and as more and more people begin to live in cities, the challenges just get bigger and bigger. And they took an approach to this of setting up smart districts. So every district is a geographically different place and different resources. And it's not, these districts are test beds where you can test your smart city propositions in a, in, a safe, in a safe space. So there's two new districts come on which aren't on there yet. One will be Smart Dublin 8, which is going to be focused on welfare of the community. And another one called Smart Tourism, which will look at new, how technologies can enhance tourism. Now, not too far from DCU up the road in Balbriggan is a new smart district. And they are mainly community focused, very, very community focused. They really want to make sure that the community are brought along. We Smart Docklands, which was the first smart district, and that's based, of course, in the centre city around the Docklands, very, very successful, and working with all the big multinationals like Google, SoftBank, very, very successful. On the south side of the city, in an urban environment, we have Smart Sandyford, which is a business park. Of course, well, we are talking here today about Smart DCU. So Smart DCU has two test beds to trial Smart City propositions. Number one, the Croke Park Smart Stadium. Now, in normal times, the ebb and flow of 83,000 fans, you could stress test any Smart City proposition. 
So currently that's very quiet at the moment, but there's no activity there. But the DCU campus in Glasnevin is the main area of activity. I'm going to look at that in detail now. Now, DCU is an amazing university, but it's not just a university. It's a microcosm of a city. It's got every feature you'd have in a city, public transport, security, accommodation, banking, all the things you have in a city. Now, this is the reason it was chosen to be a smart district, because if you can have a small a microcosm of a city, you can learn the lessons in a safe, controlled environment. But of all the districts, it is totally unique, as everything in DCU is owned and controlled by the university. And this means for third parties, getting permission is very simple. One permission is all you need, whereas any other district, multiple permissions. And this unique selling point of DCU is going to make it a very, very smart district. Now, Smart DCU is also a gateway to the Insight Center for Data Analytics. Um, of its type, it's the biggest in Europe. Um, absolutely no data analytics challenge is too big for them. Um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, com computer vision, augmented human, every skill set exists in that. And it's just, it's DCU is the co-leads co that. Now looking at some of the projects we've looked at, and um, the e-bikes, the shared e-bikes are a new phenomena and they're actually a game changer for cities because an e-bike can get you out of your car. It can flatten the hill. It means you don't have to arrive sweaty if you don't want to. You can exercise if you want, if you don't, you don't have to. So this is a whole new type of transport. And when Moby, who are based in DCU Alpha, decided to, they got a license to have these in Dublin, they first of all trialed them for DCU intercampus. Now this allowed them to pilot them, perfect them, and before they actually placed them in the city, city centre. And this was a very good community focused thing to make sure that all the bugs were, were earned out before it actually was given to the citizens. Now, this new form of transport, we're now the Insight Center for Data Analytics is actually doing in depth analysis on all the user behavior patterns. This is all anonymized, but it will show us for the first time and how city planners can use these new form of transport to alleviate congestion in cities. Another micromobility theme is the e-scooter. Now, shared e-scooters have solved the first and last kilometre mile in many cities, and thereby reduce city congestion. However, they're not all good news. Some riders would abandon them as a trip hazard on a footpath. Now, normal GPS is not accurate enough to determine if they are in a designated parking bay. So you're talking plus or minus five meters for normal GPS. But a consortium of companies in DCU Alpha, they came together and they came up with a solution they believed could locate a e-scooter to at least five centimeters, extremely accurate. Now, e-scooters are illegal on the roads in Ireland. So they could have went to Berlin or some other city to trial them, but they didn't because Smart TCU has its own closed road network. So we were able to trial them on our campus. Now this technology, when it was trialed, was picked up at the BBC because it was a world's first, absolutely amazing technology here in Ireland. So it's now being deployed commercially in the UK and other cities as well. However, this is only the start of this micro mobility journey. So it's a working assumption that later this year, e-scooters will be made legal in Ireland. Once this happens, we're going to trial an e-scooter sharing pilot for intercampus travel. So we will probably use the, the staff of DCU for this because you know, there's no students there, but the estate staff and that. And this e-scooter will go to the next generation. It'll actually use computer vision for hazard detection. It combined this with high precision, real-time locating reporting. So using AI, you can automatically predict, along with the precision positioning reporting, if it's been driven correctly or not on a footpath or where it shouldn't be. This will leverage the Insight Center for Data Analytics computer vision expertise as well. Also, using the camera, you now have the ability 
to automatically detect hazards like pedestrians in front of you and automatically reduce speed. If you also want to park and you're not inside GPS coverage, you also can use the camera to, to confirm where it's parked. So this actual micromobility trial that will be happening is going to be a world's first as well. And everything is ready to go. All we need is the e-scooters to be made legal. Now, Smart TCU has done other, other projects. In, if you talk about sustainability, we established last year a solar prospecting research team. And one of the first things we did with the team was say, hey, let's look at Crow Park. We could put lots of solar panels up there. What's the return? And we said about, jumped into this. Yes, we did. We got the assets to, of the aerial photography and that. Did, a, did the, all the mathematics, figured out exactly how much solar power you would generate. And then we decided to visit Crow Park and take the sky tour. Oh, suddenly realized it was a no-no. And um, one of the best tour attractions in Dublin is the Sky Tour on top of Crow Park. I really recommend it. But if we had solar panels up there, the reflection would destroy the whole tour. So that didn't go ahead, unfortunately. Now, but meanwhile, this solar research team, we've been talking to everybody in Ireland who is involved in renewable energy. And it's also opened up doors where they know, they know about smart DCU and they're actually looking at other ways of working with us. So, DPD have a huge depot on the countryside, and we we're talking about using that for solar prospecting. But they also are going to use their vehicle fleet to do air quality test, test, testing. And they're going to give us that data for free as well, where we Insight Center for Data Analytics can analyze it. Now, going forward, um, soon the EU are going to have a mission to have carbon neutral cities. And part of this will be an initiative to fund districts to become carbon neutral. Now, DCU is a fantastic because it's a city. It's also fully controlled. So you, if you're in a city, a city some own cities, but DCU owns everything. And we have the Insight Centre that can measure before and after. So we're looking to see, can we become part of this climate neutral cities proposition funded by the EU? Now, projects, one of the startup spin out companies from DCU is a company called High Data. And one of their areas of expertise is counting the number of people in a crowd extremely accurately. But all of this without any personal information, identifying information analyzed. So it's just outputs a number with a timestamp. This is because it's a fully self contained unit that processes everything on board and it doesn't store anything, no video or images. Another DCU startup, Ambisense, they make air quality sensors. So on the campus, we have their sensors installed and they're able to determine the, the, the elements of the, that, to, that come together to make mold in a building. So it's a balance between ventilation, heating to reduce mold. And this will give us huge expertise in that area. When they came to us, one of the things was their sensors are battery powered because they can put them anywhere, but they needed connectivity to the internet. Now, Wi-Fi is a way of connecting to the internet and it's all over DCU, except Wi-Fi is extremely power hungry. So they're using inter an internet of things technology to connect to the internet called LoRa. So we were able to give them access to the DCU LoRa wide area network. So on the top of the event building, we've installed a LoRa antenna. And this connects, this then, then can connect other wireless devices to the internet. Now, a, this is a low power wide area network. So because the internet of things only want a small piece of information to go a distance, this is optimized for that. So you can send a very tiny amount of information up to 10 kilometers away and be picked up by this. It's one of the many long range wireless area networks, which will be coming in and becoming more important as we go forward. The other one will be Sigfox and NBIOT. I'll talk about them in a while later as well. Now, DCU, we've already spoken about, we have the LoRa antenna, and um, we have the Kingspan working with us on solar prospecting. We got the bike analysis, we got the high data crowd counter, 
the scooter people, even the water dispensers on the campus, the new ones are IoT enabled and they report back on, and we can measure then the reduction in single use plastic bottles. So all of these companies are working with us now, including we recently had a smart hydrogen bus. So this is a quick overview of smart TCO where we are at the moment. Now, talking of the bus, um, DCU has considerable expertise in hydrogen, and along with CIE, the first hydrogen bus ever to enter service was brought into Ireland. And it ran on the 109A bus route linking Ashburn and the airport to DCU. But the smart DCU said, let's not just have a hydrogen bus, let's make it as smart as possible. So we spoke to all our partners and said, would you be interested in putting your sensors on the bus? And they did. So we have location and we've got environmental and we have another sensor there, AI in the edge. So all these sensors were able to report back what they were measuring. Some use the SIGFOX network, which is another low power wide area net wireless network. We use the DCU LoRa network and we use the Vodafone NBIOT network, which once again is optimized, a small bit of information, travel a great distance with very little power. Now, but one thing about the bus and transmitting IoT is if you have to send a lot of information to the internet, that consumes a lot of power. So we actually installed on the bus a halo. This is from a, another DCU company. And this had AI, at artificial intelligence at the edge. This device was able to take any sensor and work out what normal behavior patterns would be, and then only alert when something abnormal happens. So this was the bus that we had equipped with artificial intelligence at the edge. And I'm sure at the time it was the smartest hydrogen bus in the world. Now we talk about IoT. So we talk about the water dispensers. We're going to install going forward indoor air quality sensors, as we talked about, and um, occupancy sensors, carbon dioxide sensors. They can measure how congested electric hall would be, temperature sensors, bully sensors. Fully sensors will tell you in advance before the, the water comes up too high that we're about to have a flood. Now, with all this information, we have only one place to put it, and that is the concept of a digital twin. So we're going to build a digital twin. So that is the digital world, a computer simulation of the physical items. So it could be a building, an item, a car, a rocket an engine, wherever you want it to be. Well, it's a virtual representation of a physical object with real-time data feeds. So you can think this is the convergence of the digital and physical world, uh, but it's not just a technology tool. This thing can drive digital transformation. It is actually a business tool. I mean, look at that more closely. Now, if we're going to build this digital twin of DCU, we start off by, first of all, getting control ground points. Now, that could be the edge of a shore, anything that's visible from the air, we then will be scanning this year the campus using both photography and LIDAR, which is laser beams to measure very accurately the distance to the ground. And then you combine all of these and then you build a 3D model of the campus. This 3D model of the campus, you then can overlay that with lots of information. So all these data sources you're having, everything that's digital are brought into this digital twin. Now, what it's doing is it's also aligning all these independent silos of information in time and location, or as I say, spatial and temporal. So we know exactly where they fit on the planet and what time the value that they had was. You put everything in here. So including if you've got a business information model, a building information model, which is a highly accurate architect's model of a building, you can put room reservations, everything you want into the digital twin. And when you have all this information in the digital twin, you now have, you have the ability to look at things like, um, show me the rooms which are heated and unoccupied. But another good use case for DCU would be, show me the rooms that have reservations to be occupied and are unoccupied. Because there seems to be a lot of phantom bookings of lecture halls. And this, and it's so, just by uniting these two independent silos 
of room bookings, which occupancy, you now can free up so much real, real, real estate. Now, the digital twin, we see as such an important aspect of any smart city ecosystem that we're proposing and hopefully soon will announce, we're setting up a center of excellence for data capture and research. We'll be working with the university in Lithuania, KTU, which are very much an architectural university, and they're a very advanced and digital twin. But what DCU brings to us is the new dimension of data analytics. So if you think of a digital twin as a 3D model, and then you have the data over time could be considered the fourth dimension. This is a fifth dimension where you do the data analytics on that. And if you want to, by freeing up silos, bringing information together, you know, combine different silos of information. But more importantly, you can start make, looking at historic information, you can start predicting the future. Now, a digital twin, it not just frees up that, it's also a new way of visualizing information. So you can actually have a virtual reality world where you can actually see, conceptualize everything and your, the freedom this gives you. You actually can have gloves as well that you can feel you're touching something. Because very soon, we're actually going to have the emergence of the tactile internet. And the tactile internet will give you the impression that you actually can touch things. Now, as a basis, DCU is also the world's first autism friendly university. And as part of this, one of the things anybody new to the campus would find is navigating the university labyrinth is stressful, especially for the first time. But if you're autistic, it is extremely, it is going to be extremely stressful. So we're going to build a seamless outdoor indoor pathfinder. And we will use the Internet of Things as well. So having sound detectors around the campus, we can identify areas which are, have loud sounds. We can use the crowd detection to see congested areas. And what will happen is the, the user of this will be able to be told in 15 minutes, you need to be at this room. And we have now routed you in the most autism friendly route. You can also, this will be built using the principles of universal design, which means not only people who are autistic, but everybody, including people with disabilities like visual impairment, will also be able to avail of it. And that project is, is kicking off this year. So what we're seeing here is DCU is a smart city ecosystem, and you can leverage it to transform cities and communities all over the place. And um, we see it as a very safe place to pilot, perfect, and promote smart city innovations. And we welcome third parties, whoever is out there, if they want to work with us, we will use our ecosystem to support them. So thank you very much for your time. That's great. Thank you very much, Gron. Very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and there's a question or two coming in for you that we'll be able to put you later on. Um, so we'll move on to our next speaker. So who's Audrey? Um, uh, I think it's on the call. Audrey McKeown. Hello, how are you? Hi, Audrey. How are you doing? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear you fine? Great. Okay. Share my screen. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Or I should say good afternoon. It's a, uh, it's a uh, five forty-five here in California. So, um, my name is Audrey McKeown, and um, following on very aptly from um, Kieran Wong's uh, presentation about the digital twin, I'm going to talk to you today about the impact of a collaborative geospatial infrastructure in smart cities. So we're pretty much on the same page. Um, um, we know that smart city innovations have been enabled by the proliferation of uh, the internet and mobile technology, and that they comprise of all of these sensors and um, cloud technologies that improve business operations and 
give citizens a, a range of services now that they didn't have before, which make life easier and more fun and safer. But um, I'm not going to introduce another uh, smart innovation. What I'm really here to talk about is something along the lines of the digital twin that Kieran just mentioned. So I want to talk to you about how we make smart tech and smart cities smarter. And um, as was pointed out in the previous presentation, um, limiting some of these smart um, innovations um, is something that is happening because they're not connected. And so I think you can see that if we connect and collaborate a lot of these smart innovations and remove the silos where each one is individually working with a different application or a different service and bring them all together, um, we can really improve things and make these smart cities interconnected. Um, in my area of expertise, we work in the geospatial spatial industry. And um, one major common feature that underpins the existing geospatial services in all of these things is mapping and mapping information. I'd like to uh, touch on some um, touch points where geospatial data can impact a smart city. Uh, for example, in transportation, private and public utilities, and even connected healthcare. Um, we can accelerate smart city technical innovations if we enable and share services. And we can do this by using a collaborative geospatial infrastructure. So if you think about behind the scenes, everything that uses a map, and again, the previous presentation pretty much explained a lot of those. Um, you can see how we can resolve a lot of issues and provide more actionable um, services whenever we collaborate with those services. Sorry. Geospatial touch points are, um, so, oh, I'm sorry, the touch points that geospatial impact throughout a smart city. Um, if you think about every sensor or service that uses mapping information behind the scenes, the hidden real time common denominator is actually location information. In transportation departments, for example, we have sensor parking and autonomous cars, and they all rely on some form of mapping or geospatial data. In connection with the connected health, smart devices and uh, just mobile applications also use location information. In the electric and water utilities industry, they use smart meters for lots of things like maintenance, for planning, for safety and for customer support. Um, in planning departments in cities, they use geospatial information for permitting, for sustainable development, public works projects, and they all use the same underlying spatial data. So I'll give you an example of one. Um, we worked with San Jose uh, Water in uh, California, and they implemented a um, enterprise global infrastructure but they implemented it right across the organization and integrated everybody in the company with it. Because when they wanted to update one piece of information, say, for example, a customer service um, application, they wanted to update a person's uh, name and address or update that they'd moved to a new location. This rippled across the entire network of applications that they used for maintenance, for going out to fix burst pipes, um, and for any sort of planning um, in relation to that particular individual. But also, they in the um, delivery of the maintenance and any sort of updates and new planning works, they were able to put in sensors and use various types of sensors to determine if there was a burst pipe, how to reroute a network, how to switch off a particular area and then reroute water to a different area. But all of this information shared the same geospatial content. And if you think about it, that same geospatial content is relevant to the city for planning and works. It's relevant to the power companies. It's relevant to the communities. So on that digital map, you've got layers and layers of different application information, but they are all pretty much using the same underlying information. And this is what we would use for a single integrated platform. Um, if you consider the touch points that I've mentioned where all of these different data is similar and can be reused, um, how can we accelerate smart technology innovations and enable shared services? Well, if we use a collaborative geospatial infrastructure as the basis for this, um, it's possible. 
if you think very simply about airlines and banking systems, when you take some money out of the bank in one country, uh, if you're a, abroad, for example, it tells you exactly what's in your bank account. Um, they communicate and they've collaborated for a long, long time. So have airlines, if you booked a flight somewhere, you can see all the flights that are available pretty much in real time. So why can't we do this more simply in the communities? And one of the big problems is that geospatial information is quite fragmented and in silos. But if you can bring it in together in one place where everybody's using the same fundamental information, it makes it a lot, a lot easier to collaborate. So this collaboration can be quite complex, especially because uh, GIS applications to date have been very siloed information uh, repositories. Um, one of the first things that we look at whenever we develop a geospatial infrastructure is we need to make it cloud-based and we need to make sure that um, cities and partners can, multiple, can integrate multiple applications in that one platform. And when I talk about a single repository for the geospatial data, I also mean that you can use a single repository for both business information, AI information, sensor information, spatial information, and just your, your general business intelligence. So we need to do this in a way that it's encrypted, that it's distributed. Um, we distribute data sometimes particularly in the medical world where we will have medical information in one system and identity information and user name and address in a completely different system. So they're, they're connected at a different level and they're encrypted so that they can be securely accessed by users. One of the most important things if you're going to collaborate is that you can have multiple users have secure access using a group's roles and users permissions level so that only the right users can access the relevant data and everything else is secure. In order to make this more efficient, um, you need to build it on a microservices architecture. That way you can develop and update and change things without having to worry about the entire infrastructure. And finally, one of the big benefits of this is that you can use real-time collaboration 24-7. Um, you can also share data analysis and, um, for example, in the utility network that I mentioned earlier on, they can use all this, this, this one underlying system for um, utility network telemetry systems and for smart infrastructure sensors. And in addition to that, you can pre-build some of the components that are common to all and have them usable in multiple applications. I'm going to give you an example now of the collaborative geospatial intelligence um, with automated cars, so autonomous cars, I should say. So um, you can see the US DOT, they recognize that one of the big problems if you go outside a small district is that you have to have a collaborative approach to regulation, legislation, budgets, and all sorts of um, legal requirements like that. But um, if you think of that car, that autonomous Google car that went to the ice cream shop, I don't know if they were paid or that was lunch break, but I'm pretty sure that they had to use a very intense geospatial infrastructure and location intelligence to get there safely. So when we scale something like that out, if you think about it, um, something like an autonomous car can be integrated with other smart technologies like road traffic systems, sensor parking, not to mention all of the utility and the maintenance departments from water to power. It would be great if they were driving down the road and they knew in advance that there were roadworks. Um, we already work with people who have um, ambient healthcare devices like smart medical devices and monitors that tell patients whenever they're not well or they send your alert to your phone about your diabetes. Now we have ones that send you uh, information to your phone about your EKG or your heartbeat. So if you can imagine connecting those two, what would the world be like if you were driving down the road and your sensor sent not only a message to your phone, but sent a message to the hospital to say, oops, um, you know, this person's having a mild heart attack. And instead of it alerting the emergency services, it finds the nearest hospital and it tells your, your car and it reroutes you and it drives you to the hospital. No need for an emergency services crew to come and get you. So this is kind of, I know a little bit far out there, but it's not that far away. Um, 
One of the other things that we really need to consider whenever we're talking about smart cities is um, citizens. Citizens have to be at the centre of everything and more and more agencies and government departments are realising that if they can increase citizen engagement, it'll save them an awful lot of time and it'll improve uh, customer outcomes and it will also decrease costs. Um, for example, uh, if you can imagine a tree falls down and a person comes along and they see the trees falling down on the road, do they call the forestry department? Do they call the local authority? Do they call the emergency services? Or do they just call, you know, a, an emergency, a citizen emergency request where all of these different agencies that are required to fix this problem are sent out there, whether it's, you know, the forestry service, the traffic police, the power company, if it affected the, car, the power lines, the county council, to name a few, will have working on the same base map. So each in turn makes some update to their system and it could ripple across all of the internal systems that need to be updated. And that location information and other business information about, for example, the, you know, this tree down or a new power line that has to be put up or pipelines or any other infrastructure that has to be repaired, it's all notified at the same time. Um, we've seen that uh, people are getting more and more online because of the increase in internet adoption and mobile technology and even video conferencing. People don't say you're having a video conference anymore. They say we're having a Zoom. Um, people who we never thought would get online have now adapted because of COVID, unfortunately. But it's opened up new doors to increase um, citizen engagement. And if we look at the collaboration, how we can enable those citizens to not only get better services, but to engage in those services, um, it will really improve things for everybody. It becomes a win-win. Um, things to consider whenever we talk about citizen engagement. We need to consider privacy. So secure roles and user permissions and data access and anonymization uh, are very, very important features of it. Um, innovation matters because uh, people will really not adopt things unless they are innovative. They need to be new. Zoom is a fantastic example. Um, and then um, sensors matter. Um, sensors are becoming so much more of everybody's lives. Um, our previous speaker, Kieran, mentioned that, um, you know, you can wear gloves where you can actually feel like you're touching something. Um, there are other people who are developing smart clothing. So um, the clothing themselves can notify uh, systems about your health or about your activities or about your hydration. There are, I think I ran into a few in DCU in the past where they could um, indicate whether or not you were dehydrated and need to be hydrated if you were playing sports. Um, so um, hopefully that will affect the Irish rugby team and they'll get some value out of that. So in conclusion, we can see that there are many smart innovations that are limited because they don't collaborate with each other. And along with internet and mobile technology, uh, geospatial information can underpin many of those services. And we have many touch points where geospatial information impacts these technologies. So it makes sense to develop a geo uh, collaborative geospatial infrastructure, which can accelerate smart technology innovations. And this collaboration will not only help share services, but also reduce costs and increase the possibility of future innovations. And finally, I think government for the people and by the people really is what it's all about. We have to um, realise that smart cities um, realise that citizens should be at the centre of their strategic plans. And it can't really succeed without people feeling that their privacy is respected, that their services are safe, like automated cars. And um, if citizens are engaged, these services will, you know, will not only benefit them, but also bring back some residual benefit uh, to these smart service providers. So everybody wins. Has anybody any questions? Great stuff. Uh, thanks very much, Audrey. That's that's brilliant. And um, I think you can see real synergies between the three uh, speakers in terms of what was being said. Um, OK, so listen, what, what I'm going to do is actually maybe kick off the, the Q&A session at this stage uh, and have a few questions myself. So again, just for those watching, if you if you have any questions that have emerged um, since hearing the three talks, please just use the Q&A functionality at the end. 
uh, and just uh, message through what you'd like to ask and who you'd like to direct it at. And I'll, I'll be able to relay that to the, to the speakers. Um, Thank and you. Said, I have a few I have a few questions myself as well as I might I might put to the panel um, in the absence of any other questions. But we have um, two questions that came in just just at the initial part, and uh, one for Rami and one for for, for Karan. So maybe for for Rami first, and and you may have got back, back perhaps to the person uh, separately. But the question was, um, you know, when you when you talked about the um, the benefits for smart cities and, and how fantastic that is, is there a privacy concern for residents of those cities? Um, so, for example, the the attendee picked up the fact that there's a lot of surveillance cameras uh, that appeared in the video. Um, would there be concern that maybe you can have too much surveillance um, at times? Uh, and how do you get that balance right? So that's for Rami. Yes, uh, so as, as I have uh, answered the, the question, so actually the way the data are stored in the, in the cockpit in, in, an in an aggregated way, yeah. so they cannot be led back to individuals and so therefore privacy issues are not likely to arise. And then uh, uh, citizens will check consents as per G GDPR European rules in order to check and protect the data where the data are explained, where it will be stored, who will have access, and that will be the, the usage of this data. Okay, very good, very good. Um, yeah, because I think the data security is, is, is one thing that I thought of um, in, in respect to that, because that, that's a key challenge, obviously, with, with smart cities when you're kind of monitoring uh, people's behaviors and movements uh, in that way. Um, the second question came through actually was for, for Quran this time, actually. Um, and, and again, Karan, I think I think you go back to Luke, but but maybe just for the wider audience here, uh, the query was kind of in smart cities and districts, uh, what contribution could uh, interactive public furniture such as lampposts and benches provide to the area? Would this be an area you see as having potential, particularly perhaps in the context of the the, the smart DCU initiative? It's great because um, infrastructure like that can have power to it. It also has height, um, which means that you free up immediately. The constraints and you don't have to redo anything else and with internet of things they can then connect wirelessly back to the internet so street reuse, reuse of street furniture is huge uh, a lot of this will happen as well for because of the densification of 5g cells a lot of street furniture will be reused for 5g outdoor coverage as well putting 5g cells on top okay very very good um, and actually, Karan, maybe just, just a few questions I had, and, and I might come back then to Audrey with, with a question maybe after this. But um, just on your presentation, um, what was interesting is, is you talked about what Insight are doing in terms of analyzing user behavior. Um, what's the feeling in terms of the representativeness of, say, DCU as a population relative to the wider um, population in Dublin, for example, or in any, any city, um, how much can we extrapolate from that kind of behaviour or have you had discussions along that lines with Insight? Haven't had discussions yet because COVID intervened, mm. unfortunately. Um, but the, let's say the e-bike usage, all of that is not fully anonymized, um, but it's real life usage of people, where you would, what routes you would take on an e-bike, why you would take a route, why you wouldn't. Um, and that means planners will now understand how best to deploy e-bike e usage. Um, we, it's, it's a whole different behavior pattern than before. Um, and see, if a route before had a very tall hill and steep, you know, you can take it. But people also could be taking longer journeys to take less congested roads because it's less effort to take the long way around. So all of this information will be used soon to let us understand and let city planners then and not just city planners, the bike operators themselves, let them optimize their assets to the best use for people. Very good, very good. Yeah, no, and I was just, my question was thinking about, you know, say the, the, the student heavy population uh, and the kind of younger demographic to what extent that that could be widened out. But at the same time, you said there's, there's quite a diverse actually uh, community in terms of staff and students on campus. Um, so um, it, it could be quite representative actually. There will be studies on that. Um, we're very close to the autism friendly initiative. Um, and for as part of that, when the, the bus was actually uh, was due to the eyes, the lens of an autistic person, because it has less pollution, could be smoother, 
quieter. Um, so our focus at the moment will be looking at things through the eyes of the autistic or disabled person on the campus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that, and that's a pretty unique insight that can be given, um, which is, you know, pretty commendable so, on part of DCU. So later in this month, probably, DCU will produce the world's first university design guidelines for autistic, for, for it to use as an autistic campus. And those same guidelines can be used worldwide for any campus, be it a city or not. And we'll be the first in the world to do that. That's, that's that's excellent. That's excellent. And um, just, uh, just another quick question, um, just in relation to the hydrogen bus initiative um, and the way in which you were able to get the the various companies that are on campus to to provide sensors into in, into that bus. How is CIE hoping to use that information? Do you know? Uh, now you may not have insight into this, but do you have a sense of of how they're going to use that that to inform their wider fleet uh, and their wider operations? Yeah. So the answer is there is. The simple way is they're going to look at fuel consumption so that they could see if, because the telemetry of the bus will also be analyzed. So it could be that a hydrogen bus suits center city high density traffic more than city to city traffic. So if you have a fleet of hydrogen buses, where's the best place to return on investment to deploy them? So that'll be one thing that comes out of this, but there's also going to be other unknowns that we don't know yet. Um, and that's the really interesting thing. We don't go seeking things that we think we're going to find the answer to, we actually see what other trends popped up that were not obvious to begin with. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, I think the hydrogen technology generally could be very, very interesting in terms of how that goes. Um, yeah, well, hydrogen is expensive at the moment, but it won't always be. As more and more wind farms come on stream and there's more and more off-peak energy being produced, it has to be stored somehow. And hydrogen can refuel very quickly compared to electric, electric batteries, you know? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, excellent. Um, and um, Audrey, I, 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 if I could put a question to you, perhaps. Um, now I think it was it was it was mentioned actually in all the the, the presentations, but um, you know you were very clear on it. I think um, in your presentation, in terms of that that people focused nature of the initiatives, um, and th that people need to be engaged. Um, and I suppose given things around you know data security and and that kind of thing. What's your view in terms of how you best communicate the benefits to the wider population to get that buy-in from the community? Because, um, you know, I guess with the way, um, you know, there has been some controversies over data privacy particularly, um, and I suppose there are other concerns around maybe the value added of some of these initiatives. So how do you, how do you kind of communicate that uh, in a way that optimizes that engagement in your view? Uh, in a city population? Well, it's, um, it's very difficult in a lot of respects, but I think if it's coming from the actual local government level itself, um, private companies have a, you know, a heretofore had a kind of a bad reputation because people have become the product and that has been abused. And we've seen that all over the place, especially in the United States. Um, so whenever you have any sort of new initiative like this, um, I think uh, you have to start small, uh, like Kieran Mahan has said, and do it at a local level and get buy-in. And again, if you look at the Zoom example, um, what they did was they used you know, everybody just started using Zoom and people started using it as a verb, you know. So whenever you want to engage people, I think, number one, you have to start small. And it's very difficult to get a collaborative group of people together. But again, Insight is a great place to go for something like that, because they have all those contacts and all those routes into all of these different agencies and departments and the people who can pull all of these different smart technologies together and then become the hub that actually makes it all happen. But you do have to give people a real um, transparency about what way their data is going to be used. And this is where GDPR became a thing. And this is really why it became, you know, uh, was invented in the first place. But um, letting people know exactly how their data is being used, letting them know upfront uh, what's anonymized. I think we make it a little bit too easy sometimes to just tick a box and say, I accept. I've read the terms and conditions of Zoom, by the way. So I can tell you that on most of the machines in our company, 
um, it's not allowed because of the terms and conditions where they can actually take your data and store it in the United States instead of under the GDP or regulations in the EU or the area that it's supposed to be in. So there are various things like that where if you're more transparent and you have a, um, a mission and a reputation as a private company or a business that you don't exploit um, people's information, I think that's a huge, huge thing that you need to do. So it really comes down to companies having a good reputation, being very upfront, legislation protecting people from companies, because that's what GDPR does. And I see that as a big win-win, especially because we work so much in healthcare. And healthcare is an area where it can be so connected with all of this information we're talking about, this geospatial information, this uh, digital twin, that can store so much information, it's frightening. So if you think of that concept and the way people are so willing to jump in to all of these free services like Facebook and social media and things like that, um, at the other end of it, they come out and realize, oh, I've given up all of this personal information. So you need to have those things in place. The uh, you have to have the, the buy-in, the transparency, and you definitely have to have some legislation to protect them. And I think then it makes it a lot easier to have your reputation up front and centre and associate with companies that do have that sort of culture within them. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that, that On a technical, fun. sorry, just on a technical yeah. level, um, if I jump back to one of the slides I showed you, um, we designed a, 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 a microservice identity um solution so that we can manage the groups, the users and roles and permissions. And I'll give you a, an example in the medical world. So if you want to use our system collaboratively for um, say rehabilitative healthcare or any sort of acute service outside of a hospital, and you want to, your doctor wants to send you for a referral somewhere or invite your physiotherapist to come and look at your record or invite somebody else who's doing some sort of outdoor care, like an occupational therapist or somebody else, they can all have a certain permission where they can see certain information, but not all information. And so if you have a good identity management system and you develop a, a system that's based on groups, users, roles and permissions, you can very securely make sure that only the right people see the right data. And yet in a city environment, if you look at the underlying, um, we're talking about the geospatial uh, infrastructure uh, in my presentation, but it's also business information. But if you take the fundamentals as the, as the physical infrastructure and build it out from there, all of the, um, all of the various components of that are they're pretty, they're all pretty common in terms of the physical world. So that map that Kieran showed where you could see all of these different sensors on all of these different buildings and all of these different routes and all of these different things feeding in. Well, that's all based on a, on a physical location. And if you can make sure that people know that that's anonymized and you can have users roles and permissions and that identity management system, then you can securely and you know reassure people that only the certain information that will be available to the people who need it and that the rest of their information is anonymized. And that's very possible. That's very good. Yeah. And I, it, it seems to be then that if you can get that reassurance, if you can kind of communicate that reassurance around the, the protection of data, uh, then you can start to focus more the conversation on the value added and the benefits that these that these various you know services will, will provide to the community. And then that starts to override those concerns that people might have. Um, I think there's a bit of a journey there yet, though, given <laughs> given the people's past there experiences is. of data. Um, but I think that's certainly a point where you'd like to see things get to, I'm sure. But young people jump in, and if you've seen, especially with COVID-19, older people who I never would have thought uh, would pick up a smartphone are now using Zoom. They're using technologies that they didn't feel comfortable with. So in a, in a, in a sad kind of way, um, if you're forced to, you'll adopt it. If you see everybody else using it, like uh, Zoom and Facebook and social media, you'll adopt it. So you have to have that sort of um, access to people as well. And again, I jump back to um, um, Insight. Working with DCU provides an awful lot of that for you. It's a great test bed. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks very much, Audrey. Um, so I'm just looking through the, the, the list of questions. So we, we don't have any further questions um, at, at, at the moment. Um, and I think, I think you've addressed my own queries very, very well there. So um, 
Uh, I'll maybe just give one last chance if somebody wants to get their last question in last minute before we before we go to close the session. Um, okay, so I think that's it actually. Um, so obviously what I'd like to do is to thank the speakers today. So again, thanks Remy, uh, Karan and uh, Audrey for your respective uh, presentations. Really, really interesting. Um, I'm a bit blown away by some of the the initiatives and some of the innovations that you've talked about here today. And I think there's a lot in the in the audience who would agree with that as well. So um, as I said, just thank, thanks very much for your insight, very interesting talks um, and for your participation in, in this in this transform series. Um, just to maybe communicate, obviously this, as you probably know, this is a this is a week long series. Um, so for those that are interested, there are going to be more sessions on um, transform smart cities and communities taking place at the same time uh, every day this week until Friday, uh, the 12th. Uh, so specifically tomorrow, we have uh, Dave, David Curtin, CEO of IEDR, um, Gronio O'Keefe, CEO at uh, Ludgate in Skibbereen, Amanda Byrne, Acting Director of Services in Wexford County Council, and Michael Dre, District Manager at Gorey uh, Kilmockridge District. Uh, on Wednesday then, we will have David Zambrana and Leon Nayalase of uh, CERC and Dirk Allers of the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, which will also be part of our weekly SDG for B. Um, so that's our, our similar series of focuses on the sustainable de development goals for business. Uh, on Thursday, we will then have uh, Tiernan um, Mines, CEO and co-founder of Hello Land Post, uh, Niall Cunningham, CEO at Civic Group, uh, Juan um, Sabada, um, who is assistant professor in architectural and urban design of the University of the Basque Country, and then Noam Burson Brand and Agencies Partnership Manager at Pavagen. And then finally, on Friday, we're going to have Robert Sanders of Iris, who's going to talk uh, to everybody. So you can see it's a pretty packed schedule of, um, again, really, really interesting uh, speakers from across academia and industry. Um, and so we very much hope that you can uh, continue to join us for the rest of the series. Uh, and so once again, I'd really like to thank um, Rami, Caron and Audrey again for, for your input today. Really, really, um, really, really insightful. And um, hopefully you might be able to jump into some of the sessions later in the week as well. Super. That's great. Okay. okay. And obviously to thank all the participants for, for joining us as well. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.